Welcome to Knowledge. I'm your host, Amy Walden. In this episode, we're catching up with Tara Dudley and Kathleen Powers Conti. Tara Dudley is an architectural historian and assistant professor at the University of Texas at Austin and is delivering the 2024 James P. Jones Distinguished Lecture here at Florida State University. And Kathleen Powers Conti is a public historian and preservation professional and an assistant professor in FSU's Department of History, part of the College of Arts and Sciences. Tara and Kathleen, thank you both so much for joining me today. Well, thank you for having us. So to start, can you both tell me a little bit about the kinds of work you do in your field? Tara, we'll start with you. Certainly. Uh, over the past 20 plus years, I've done a variety of historic preservation work as well as historic research on a variety of topics, uh, mostly focused on Texas, especially in Austin, where I've worked as a historic preservation consultant for a very long time. And uh, my academic research uh, similarly covers topics in Texas and Louisiana, but the kinds of projects that we work on really run the gamut uh, for anywhere from historic resource surveys for municipal or federal agencies. Uh, I have a specific interest in historic interiors. So I've written several historic uh, furnishings reports for different clients over the years. Uh, and this is in addition to my personal and academic research as well. Uh, National Register nominations include the kinds of projects we've worked on. So it really is a variety that has to deal with architectural history and historic preservation. Wonderful. And Kathleen? Um, so I started consulting in historic preservation during college. And so I started learning about how important it is to work with communities to preserve the history that's important for them. And so as I went through grad school and consulted professionally, I've worked in 45 different states on a variety of projects. And so a lot of them I got to do with Tara, which has been wonderful, but they range just really large in scope, whether it's doing mitigation reporting because you're putting in a cell phone tower and you want to make sure it doesn't damage historic resources, or you're building a highway, or you're wanting to redesign museum exhibits, or you're wanting to make sure that a community whose history has been purposely ignored or erased is no longer ignored and erased. And so it means that we've gotten to travel and do a lot of these really great research projects in addition to the academic work that we both do. So a lot of my focus has been working with historically disenfranchised or marginalized communities communities and helping them navigate the really complex system for federal legislation that makes it hard to have people preserve the things that are important to them in their community. Um, a lot of my academic work follows that same fashion. Um, and so the book that I'm working on right now is looking at a historic plantation in Virginia and the ways in which it's not telling the full story of the history that's there. And so a lot of the work that Tara and I both do is working with communities to help preserve what's important to them rather than being outsiders sort of parachuting in and telling them like, we as these outside historians think this is important and it's it's waiting and listening to them and helping them navigate the, the systems in place. And really just in engaging not only those communities, but just the stories, the histories, mm -hmm. so that they are more accessible for a variety of um, audiences. So a lot of what we do are for clients, um, you know, municipal governments, agencies, but also increasingly being able to create the kind of documentation or reports that communities can use to preserve their historic or cultural resources as well. Um, and, you know, I think we both write in ways that uh, tend to be more accessible to the general public as well as academic, and really just being able to share that information and share those stories so that our work also really serves as a form of social justice uh, and is not just something that is elitist and inaccessible. Yeah, and a lot of it is coming in, like especially some of the communities we've worked with have been really damaged by climate change, especially on the Gulf Coast in Florida, Louisiana, Texas. And so it's coming in and helping them navigate okay, when the next hurricane comes, how do we make sure that what is important to your community is preserved? How do we make sure that you're planning for the future and not just trying to slowly catch up? And so a lot of it is working with different communities that have been, you know, especially with hurricanes, right? It's there's not a lot of time to prepare. And so it's thinking future planning of, okay, if this community, if this space is important to you, if these stories, how do we make sure that your community survives the next hurricane, even if some of the buildings do not? Yeah. It's very important being able to take that work, look ahead, and then also, as you mentioned, translate that to the public. It's very important. The two of you have worked together on some pretty remarkable preservation projects, including on the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta and the birth home of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Can you tell me how you got involved in these projects and what that preservation work entailed? 
Sure. So that particular project was essentially a three for one. We were hired by the Park Service, the firm that we worked for, to uh, write historic furnishings reports, which again are my wheelhouse for not only MLK's birth home, but also for Ebenezer Baptist Church and Fire Station Number 6, which is the historic fire station that anchored the Sweet Auburn neighborhood in which Dr. King grew up. And so in doing that research, we were looking not only at the history and evolution of those buildings, but the collective history history of the Sweet Auburn neighborhood and Black Atlanta of the time period, and then taking that information to create a historic context to make recommendations for how the Park Service might then reinterpret those spaces or include uh, documentation, whether it's exhibits, change the, um, the layout and design of period spaces in those interiors to reflect the historic context or maybe specific periods of significance that they wanted to particularly focus on uh, with future research and for future visitorship at the site. Yeah, so it was a really, it was a, we did it for a couple of years mm -hmm. um, and it finished in 2020. So, you know, not quite the end of the project we had imagined, but it was really intense. We did research in a variety of states. We worked with the King family. I got to go through a lot of Martin Luther King Jr.'s like family photos and his paperwork and wow. talking to some of the family members to figure out how did it actually look when he lived here? What are the stories that are important? And bringing up some of the things like when he was a child, you know, he didn't want to do chores. And so <laughs> he would like go hide in the basement to read comic books, right? And there used to be a garage in the backyard and he may or may not have crashed a car into the garage. That's why the car is not there, right? And so it's sort of the thing of people when we have these great heroes in our national history, sometimes people only think of them as like this great hero that's like, unapproachable and not a human anymore. And so a lot of it is wanting to rehumanize and Absolutely. make sure that when you're telling the story of his birth home, it's his childhood home. Like this is where he played basketball and this is where he read comic books and this is where he ate his favorite dinner. And so working with this really wide range of historic resources of doing community interviews and figuring out what's the best way to make sure this community space is still a good community space. And so with the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church, you know, it's so important for the Sweet Auburn community, the fire station, his church, and the birth home is his anchor. And so for the community that's living there today, dealing with the fact that there's thousands of people coming to visit this national park site, but it's still their home, it's still their neighborhood. And so making sure that our recommendations balance the preservation, but also the current needs of the community that's living in that neighborhood. Absolutely. So it's really considering the not only interpretive needs of the park service, but also the human and day to day needs of the community and the current inhabitants. And I think my favorite part of doing historic furnishings reports are really kind of just re energizing and re innovating those historic spaces. And especially with a site like Ebenezer Baptist Church or Martin Luther King's birth home spaces that really are sacred. And so you, you know, tend to, there's almost a, a barrier and you're separating yourself and not visualizing them as a space where Dr. King and his siblings grew up, you know, with their grandmother cooking in the kitchen and the family playing games, um, you know, and so recommending things like there should be baby bottles and diapers in the room where he was born um, <laughs> and things of that nature, uh, thinking about the long history of the site, not as a, not only as a private residence, but also as a park service site, because there's a its own history and a narrative that developed as a result of that. And so looking back on the history of interpretation and uh, reconfiguring that within the sometimes the changing mission of the park service was really interesting. Um, one of the, I think, most fun parts of the project for me was looking back on how when the birth home was first open to the public and the steps that the park service was taking to interview Dr. King's sister and his mother, who were still living at the time, to um, work with them and sort of rediscover what the spaces looked like and, you know, how did you furnish the space and looking at Sears catalogs. And so I went back and did that very thing and looked at Sears catalogs. And, you know, this is the kind of window curtains or, you know, furniture that might have been in that space. And then aligning that with some of the oral history of the family and other people who had visited the home. Uh, so it was really a, a fun project in a lot of different ways, very rewarding, obviously, um, to continue commemorating a figure like Dr. Dr. King and to be able to assist the Park Service with, um, you know, their current mission and continuing mission as, of course, this is going to be a site that is accessible to people for years and years to come.
It's fascinating. And I think those small details help really bring history to life. And I'd love to hear a little bit more in your own words about why this type of preservation work is so important. We could probably write a book. We probably <laughs> should, should write a book, <laughs> write a book about this. on this. Um, but just I, I, I've talked to some students uh, here at Florida State in the history department today. And one of the things I talked to them about in my research is just how much I find people from so many different walks of life are connected. Um, and it's that connectivity, you know, that make us all human, that make us all American, I think is a, a through line and just, you know, something very simple and straightforward without even really, you know, going into detail about the history or as an architectural historian, specific buildings or built environments, and just learning more about our collective history and how much that is shared. It has been something that's really rewarding and what I like to share with people. Well, and for me, so much about why historic preservation is important is it's because it's what people really love, right? So if you talk to people about like where they want to go on vacation, right? They'll say New Orleans, they'll say New York, they'll say Boston, they'll say Charleston, and it's all of those places have really strong historic preservation ordinances, right? That's what helps a community define its identity is within the built environment. And so some of it is just showing people like the reason you love those places is because of historic preservation. And so a lot of it is teaching them and just communities in general, like how do you preserve these stories? And then what's the benefit for it, right? Because I think sometimes people think like the liberal arts doesn't matter or history doesn't matter or history is boring. And so it comes down to for every dollar invested in historic preservation in Texas, it brought $5 back to the state, mm -hmm. right? Wow. And like what type of return on investment do other things have for that, right? And that's what historic preservation does is it preserves communities, it revitalizes communities, it brings in tourism, it brings in, you know, if people are remodeling historic homes, you're bringing in new jobs, you're doing lots for the community. And so, so much of what Tara and I talk about is like helping communities find their story and preserve it and make sure it continues for different generations. And we love obviously historic buildings and can talk about them all day. But for us, it's really prioritizing like the stories over the stones, right? Yeah. That even if the building is gone, the story is still there. And that's something that I've run into a lot with my work is people will say, well, like, oh, well, this building is gone, so it doesn't matter anymore. And it's like, no, the history is still there. The community might still be there connecting people and, and making sure that, you know, everyone gets a chance to discover their own history. Yeah. And really just, you know, balancing the, um, you know, the actuality of historic preservation as an economic tool mm -hmm. so that it is fair for different communities. But also uh, it's important to think about historic preservation as an economic tool, but also as a tool for social justice um, and really leveling the playing field for communities to be able to survive, especially historic communities um, that have been marginalized uh, at different points in history as well. And helping people to understand that, you know, although you have academics, you have professionals and preservationists and consultants who are coming in that you can be your own historic preservationist, um, you know, and there are different ways that people can apply that knowledge and that action, that agency within their own communities as well. Tara, you're giving a presentation called Building the Nation, Enslaved and Free Architects, Builders and Artisans for this year's James Jones Distinguished Lecture. Can you tell us a little bit more about what your presentation will discuss? Sure. Uh, my presentation today will essentially encapsulate the research that I've done focusing on free people of color in New Orleans and their contributions to the built environment in the antebellum city there, and also in combination with some of my more recent research on African-American builders and craftsmen in Austin, sort of framing them in the larger context of contributions of people of the African diaspora in the United States. Awesome. Well, we're looking forward to tuning in and it's a hybrid event. So that's great, too. And Kathleen, what does it mean to the Department of History to have Tara Dudley as this year's distinguished lecturer? Um, I mean, so many things. We were so excited when we um, asked Dr. Dudley if she would come and she was able to say yes, because we know she has a very packed schedule. Her most recent book won a ton of awards. And so kind of have to fight to be able to get one of <laughs> one of her spots in her very busy schedule. So some of it for our department is we're so excited to bring in different voices, different people. And some of it is just we want to honor James Jones. And that's why we have this great memorial lecture in American history. But also some of it is to get exposure to new, exciting research. And so to hear about Tara's first book, hear about her second book, 
book. Um, but one of the things that I love is we always want to make sure we connect our grad students to other professionals in the field. And so that's something that Dr. Dudley is passionate about as well. And so she was able to meet with a lot of our grad students and talk to them about their dissertation, about their research, about if they're wanting to go in consulting, how to navigate that. And so it's not just her coming in for just, you know, a two hour talk. It's getting the chance to have her connect to our undergrad and our graduate students and bring in, you know, this nationally recognized scholar um, and have her come visit. We're so glad that you're here. <laughs> well, I'm delighted to be here. Tara and Kathleen, thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast. And if you would like to learn more about today's guests and the 2024 James Jones Distinguished Lecture, visit history.fsu.edu. We'll see you next time on Knowledge. Knowledge.